So we are very pleased today to have James O'Shaughnessy here on the podcast. Uh, James is one of the very few investors who can truly claim to having changed the way that uh, investors approach the stock market. Uh, he spent more than 30 years researching equity market returns, uh, and his uh, work is focused on what's called uh, fundamental quantitative uh, research. Uh, his groundbreaking studies became uh, uh, focused on you know, factor investing uh, and it has continued to evolve the way that he, that, the way that he and his firm applies factor investing. Um, and he currently is the, uh, I believe, chairman of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which manages over $5 billion uh, in assets across 17 strategies. Uh, for most professional money managers, uh, those achievements would be enough. Uh, but he's also been very generous in the way that he shared his research. Um, and he uh, is the author of four books, including What Works on Wall Street, uh, which was uh, uh, transformational in his own career, but also the career of many, many investors, uh, professional and, uh, and retail. Um, and the book has four editions, uh, the most recent published in 2012. Uh, and he sets out uh, how elements of value, quality, and momentum combine uh, to create uh, outstanding investment returns. Um, and and in, in our opinion, uh, kind of what, what sets Jim apart is his willingness to follow the data uh, in challenging uh, assumptions, even previously held views. Uh, and what's left is a, is a, a framework, an investment philosophy uh, that, that's kind of truly all weather uh, and can work in uh, kind of across across the market cycle. So uh, today, uh, Jim's son, Patrick, actually uh, runs, uh, runs O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, and we'll talk a little bit about that transition. Uh, and, but Patrick is, is also uh, you know, a kind of a thought leader in his own right. He published a book, Millennial Money, uh, and, uh, and Yvonne uh, and the team have, have translated that into Spanish for, for our Spanish investing audience. Uh, and he, and as I mentioned, he currently is the president of, of Ocean CS Management. So, uh, so Yvonne and I are very happy to have Jim on the show, and we look forward to uh, to, to digging into to, to your thoughts and, and the way that uh, you can your, your ideas can continue to help uh, generate uh, generate positive performance, uh, you know, for, for investors. Well, thank you, Michael, for having me. I feel a little bit like Mark Twain when somebody was giving him a such a glowing introduction that he said he could hardly wait to get up and hear himself talk. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you've you, you've earned it. So so let's so so let's see. You deserve so, it. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> my my family would say otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's hey, it's, well, what's the saying? You know, it's, maybe it's, it's, it's hard to be uh, it's hard to be a king in your hometown or something like that. Or that's yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to be an expert, you got to travel. <laughs> that's right. Right. Yeah, totally, That's totally. Exactly. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> very good. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, so, so I think, uh, you know, among many things, uh, I, I think people affiliate you and, and O'Shaughnessy management with, uh, you know, with, with, with quant, with quant investing, with quant strategies. Um, so, so kind of take us back to the beginning. I mean, how, how did you get started there? You know, what was maybe kind of an early insight or early kind of hypothesis that you wanted to, to test? And, and, and kind of how, how'd you, how did you get started? So thanks, Michael. I'm going to out myself as a nerd here because um, we, uh, we would have family meetings where my uncles, they had an investment uh, pool together. And uh, when I got old enough, about 16, I got invited to the, the big table uh, mm -hmm. where, where they would have quarterly meetings to discuss you know, their investments. And I was listening to my father and my uncle John having a conversation. I still remember this, 1976, about IBM and, and about the CEO, right? And, and so the whole thing was just about this guy. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it make more sense to like see how much you have to pay for every share or dollar of earnings or dollar of cash flow? And they looked at me like I had three heads. Uh, back then, back then in the 70s, uh, most investing was like talking about personalities. Uh, there was a lot of good academic work um, that got started, Lakanashok uh, et al., um, French and Fama, et cetera, but um, wasn't really looking at the market from the point of view of a practitioner. Uh, so I took, uh, this will really date me, uh, a paper spreadsheet that was this wide. 
uh, down to a research library in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I was raised. Um, and uh, even then I was extraordinarily lazy. So I decided I was gonna focus on the 30 stocks and the Dow and not the S&P 500. But what I did was I listed all 30. I looked up what 30 were in the Dow for every year. And I did about 20 years um, and found a very strong correlation uh, between valuation and return. Um, uh, it ultimately led me to write an article for Barron's uh, that sorted uh, the Dow on dividend yield. Now that doesn't work anymore. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but um, so I was hooked, uh, but I also liked girls a lot. So <laughs> I, I put my spreadsheet away, uh, got married pretty young and then uh, got computers and databases and kind of the rest was history. That's totally. awesome. Yeah. That <laughs> That's interesting. Totally interesting. Actually, how has quantitative uh, investing changed over the past couple of decades? And uh, markets uh, are highly adaptive uh, and good at comparing away systematic advantages. So after 15 years, does what works on Wall Street still work on Wall Street? So, uh, yes. Uh, but what we have to do is take a step back and understand the research process, right? So um, what Wall Street is very efficient at is arbitraging away like mathematical anomalies. Wall Street is very inefficient at arbitraging away human nature. I always say that markets change second by second human nature barely budges millennia by millennia, the last sustainable edge is human nature. And that hasn't changed. And we see this in markets the way they behave today. We see it in markets the way they behaved back during the South Sea trading scandal that Isaac Newton lost a fortune in. But what you want to do is constantly evolve your research. Some examples, um, price to book. Price to book used to be a great single factor to identify value. Well, that was before uh, the economy changed to mostly intangibles, mostly brand value. And so as we continued to do our research, my research team, luckily, much smarter than me, and so they come up with all these brilliant ideas, said, you know, I think price to book uh, isn't going to work anymore. And so we took a look um, and in fact, it became very much more spotty because of the transfer to intangible. For example, uh, GDP. GDP is meaningless these days because it does not account for all of the intangibles. It's an, it's an industrial era uh, uh, factor. So what we do um, is we do this continual research and, and we evolve our models. So, for example, um, if you'd read the first edition of What Works on Wall Street, I would have said, you know, buy cheap stocks on the mend. You can decide that they're cheap by looking at the price to sales ratio. Well, as uh, I actually wrote a piece uh, that you can include if you like, it's called Mistakes Were Made and Yes by Me. Um, sure. that, was, that was kind of a rookie error on my part because um, I was looking at a specific end date, right? And for the first book, I think it was 1992 or three. Um, I subsequently learned, actually through an academic paper, so I thank those academics, saying, you know, O'Shaughnessy's stuff is really interesting, but he should really combine the, the factors. And I'm like, well, that's a very good idea. So in <laughs> fact, we did that. And now we do everything, all of the various factors that we use are composites of individual factors because uh, value, for example. We want to be able to cover the entire balance sheet from the top to the bottom. And you can't do that if you're looking at just say price to uh, sales or price to book. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see that everything we're doing is now a composite that gets the full value flavor of a company. We are often associated with value investing uh, because we do use value factors and, and we have several portfolios that have done very, very well with them. However, we, we, are, we are agnostic in terms of um, value, momentum, quality. We use them all and, and they work at different times in the market cycle. And so 
if you if you go to osam.com and, and take a look at our uh, screening methodology, what you'll see is that we have you know uh, a quality factor. We have a financial strength factor uh, because as we've um, luckily, as I've added all these super smart people, we've been able to move and evolve the research forward. Now, evolve, not revolutionize, right? So we're not saying, oh, you know, all that stuff we said earlier, that doesn't work anymore. It, it does, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work as well as the evolved versions of the strategies that we are now using. Uh, we often look um, at an old version of a strategy, um, say that had, has not changed from like say 10 or 15 years ago. And then we compare it to the new version that we're using. And they're, they're, it's a huge difference. The, mm -hmm. the, the performance of the new ones, much, much better. Yeah, you know, and, and I, think, I think intuitively, uh, um, you know, just the notion of combining factors, you know, you know even if we're not gonna, you know, kind of pick apart the, you know, the actual formulas, but just the notion of, you know, the kind of a, a common knock against, you know, value is, okay, yeah, you know, you're just buying things that are cheap and, and you can fall in the proverbial value trap. But, you know, if you combine that value factor with, you know, quality factors to say, okay, we want to buy something cheap, but also has good quality of earnings or, or also has, you know, you know, good quality of cash flows, um, or, or we want to buy something that's cheap that maybe already has some momentum behind it, which says that, you know, the market, you know, kind of being smarter than, than me says, well, hey, you know, you know, we may be kind of past the worst of this or, or you know, this, you know, this story might actually have some exit velocity, um, you know, and so basically combining different factors can, can kind of help maybe avoid kind of the, the mistakes that, that the factor in its purest form might be inclined to, to, to make. That, that, that's exactly right. And there's lots of good examples of that. Um, an exa a really good example would be um, during the financial crisis. If you were just a deep value person and you were looking at, say, Citi, um, you would say, I got to buy this stock because you know it had a 7.5% dividend yield. Uh, it looked great until you looked at the financial strength factor, mm -hmm. which was in the worst decile. And the worst decile of financial strength um, on its own goes mm -hmm. on to do really, really badly. Yeah. And so um, by combining uh, the look and getting a more nuanced look at uh, each individual name, uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to be uh, have better batting averages, better base rates uh, than if you're um, you know, like looking at a single name. We never look, by the way, at like, I have no opinion on any individual name I own. I, for the most part, I don't even know what they are. <laughs> They're ticker symbols, but I do know, and I can talk to you all day long about their underlying factors. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, it's kind of like um, a good example would be uh, a doctor just looking at you and saying, hey, Michael, you look great. <laughs> good, you're healthy. Go ahead and leave. Um, but then he takes an MRI of you and he's like, oh, I, everything worked out, I'm sure, Michael. But <laughs> yeah, when, when, he, when, he, when he looks at the MRI, he sees what is really going on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty much what we do. We, we try to avoid um, opinions in terms of, you know, I like that stock or I hate that CEO. And, and I can't tell you the number of times I've seen conventional managers fall into this trap. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not smarter than they are. I just know I'm dumber than they are, really. <laughs> I, 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 I realize that, that my opinion is, is going to probably be just as wrong as everyone else's. So um, instead, of, instead of offering an opinion or, or trying to make a decision based on my opinion, which I understand is pretty worthless, I like to go to the data and, you know, listen to what the data tells me. Um, and when you do that, it's, it's really cool because... Uh, you mentioned uh, stocks emerging, right? So uh, back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, one of our small cap growth strategies that had a strong value overlay, all of a sudden starts buying, you know, a bunch of tiny steel companies. And, 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 and I call my head of research in and I'm like, Chris, what, can, can you give me a narrative for this? And he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll Bloomberg it and see what I can find. And he's like, <laughs> No, I, I, I can't. Uh, he goes, but they're, they qualify. Well, about five months later, 
everybody's writing about it. This was mm -hmm. when China was exactly. consuming all the steel in the world, exactly. and they exactly. were building yeah. the they were uh, building the equivalent of one Boston every month. Mm -hmm. And so, but the point is, narrative usually follows price, For sure. not For sure. the other way totally. around. I mean, in, yeah, anybody, as you go day by day, you know, pull a Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal or whatever, you know, it's just, we're just fitting, we're just fitting news to the price action, you know, and, and, exactly. and, and technology is in favor, it's in favor, it's the greatest thing until you wake up one day and, and it's down 3%. And then it's like, oh, well, technology is the worst thing. And, you know, you know and just the narrative, you know, or interest rates, you know, banks, whatever, you know, whatever topic you want to pick, you know, tell me the last click and I'll tell you what, you know, what they're going to say on the front page, you know, and, and it's not not particularly helpful. No, in fact, I think it's very misleading. But it's it's baked it's baked into human uh, operating system base code, mm -hmm. yeah, and totally. and you know we we seek this illusion of control, and the the way we uh, provide it the best for ourselves is to create narratives about mm -hmm. what we're what we're seeing. Um, I'm I, I do it too. I, if you're a human being, you do it. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Robert Robert Schiller wrote a book on it relatively recently about uh, yes, you know, narr narrative economics. Yeah, it was a good exactly. book. Uh, he's he's a great economist. Um, so uh, learning, you know, about our own human nature, I have found to be very helpful. I think if you study evolutionary biology and psychology, you'll see that um, we're, we're all pretty much the same. <laughs> In other words, if, if you're totally. a human being, you're running human OS, and you are going to be as likely, no matter what you think, to commit those behavioral errors mm -hmm. as anyone else. And mm -hmm. you're only fooling yourself. One of my heroes is Richard Feynman, the physicist. And he goes, the first rule is don't fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. <laughs> and so... You know, with that as kind of our mantra and, and you know, just being humble about knowing how little we know, we've done pretty well. Mm -hmm. no, that's, that's great. interesting because, yep, I, actually, the, the, later I'll ask you a question that is a challenging question, and it has to do with, uh, the, with this idea of the, the, the rise of intangible assets and this, uh, this thing that you are talking about, about the, the composite to uh, kind of uh, solve part of that problem. Maybe it takes us to, or your, your answer, I don't know, we'll, later we'll see, but maybe it leads to part of the solution. Let's see the other part of the solution, but later. Now I have okay. a question that has to do with the, uh, the custom indexing, this, this idea that OSAM is focused. What is said and how have recent markets, trends and technology developments evolved to make it the next frontier in investment management? So thank you. Um... I have been uh, obsessed with the idea of custom portfolio creation since I founded a company called Netfolio in 1999 and 2000, actually got a patent on distributing investment advice across a worldwide computer network. That's how old I am. Uh, the, the, the technology back then wasn't ready, um, but when I spun out of Bear Stearns to create O'Shaughnessy Asset Management during the global financial crisis, um, I made a decision that I wanted to have all of our technology built by our technologists. And this is really important because there, it's, a, it's a big area now, this whole idea of custom uh, indexing, custom uh, creation. But if you don't have a deep history in financial management and asset management, as well as the tech chops to understand all of those moving parts, and they are not trivial. I'll give you an example. Tax lots. Um, our, our Canvas program, uh, I believe, uh, championed by my son, we took advantage of almost 20 years of technology build uh, that, that we used to create the end product, which is Canvas. It, I honestly believe, is going to be table stakes by about 2025. Um, the, the, the superiority of it is, I, I just don't know how you argue against it. Number one, uh, it takes your, uh, Ivan, let's say you came to us, uh, or Michael, you came to us and you said, look, I, 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 you know, I work at Google and I've got this huge Google position and, and I want to not, I want to de-emphasize that, done. You tell us you want to harvest taxes going along for you only, done. 
we can generate, um, you know, not always, of course, but we can generate anywhere between 50 and 100 basis points of what we call tax alpha for your portfolio alone. You tell me that you have daughters or that your wife, uh, Michael, your wife has some, some great uh, art behind you there, uh, is involved in something and you, you want to emphasize uh, 20% of your portfolio uh, that has uh, uh, 20% or more women in the C-suites or um, in, uh, on the board. Done. And so all of the various aspects um, of uh, what I think is coming down the pike here are, are combined in Canvas. And um, we got some really great advice from some venture friends of ours. And they told us, go slow, uh, start with uh, a small group of investors uh, or advisors that you trust, listen to them. Mm-hmm. And we, we did that. And uh, the, the suggestions were invaluable. Um, we're almost at $2 billion in assets under management. We haven't... Isn't, even been two years and the launch. And are those are those your are, are are you guys carving assets internally from 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 your from O'Shaughnessy's assets, or are those so also third party assets that are being the, managed the, on the, the Canvas the, platform? The, those are new assets, the ones that I'm mentioning. The it's about mm-hmm. one point seven billion as of today, um, and in a very short period of time, we are converting the O'Shaughnessy separately managed account platforms to Canvas because it's just better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what we find is, um, you, by the way, you can come to Canvas and just uh, buy an index fund if you want. Um, customization is entirely up to the end client. Uh, we work through advisors. And uh, what we found is people want to customize. Mm-hmm. Basically, when we look yeah. at all of our accounts, more than 80% of them are unique. Mm-hmm. And so this is impossible without this technology backbone. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it is, you know, the accumulation of 20 plus years of us building technology for asset management. I can't stress that enough. Y- you know, we, we invest in, t- in tech operations as well. And we think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on over there. But I think you really need that domain knowledge. And, you know, frankly, as a, as a quant, you're probably perfectly suited because you can build your your idea of how to build things is different than say a a fundamental person. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think that um, given all of its advantages, why would anyone buy a packaged product? I mean, why would, why would say if you're a big ESG investor, um, which is social investing, Mm -hmm. if you take a look, I mean, just if you want, if you want a horror show, look at some of the big uh, EFT funds and look at what they contain. Uh, <laughs> not, not very, uh, very social in many regards. Now, listen, uh, look, th- there's lots of paths towards success and, and there could be very good reasons why somebody wants to build a portfolio using ETFs or, or using mutual funds, etc. cetera. We're, we're not saying, we're not saying it's our way or the highway. We learned that long ago, but for the, for the person who, needs to have these kind of things built into their portfolio. I often say, uh, one of my favorite books is by Peter Drucker, you know, the management mm-hmm. consultant, exactly. but it's, it's, it's not a management book. Uh, it's called Recollections of a Bystander. And it, it's about all the really interesting people he's met in life. And one of them just sticks out to me because it was a merchant bank in London that he worked for in the 1930s. And I was reading it again. And I said to my son, Patrick, they manage money the way Canvas manages money. And, and then it was like the aha moment. They were so specific to each individual client's needs that people wouldn't even think of going elsewhere or, or getting you know, packaged in with other people. And, and that's what the technology has finally unlocked. So I'm, I'm obviously incredibly bullish. Also, and this is one of my little... Um, things, but I've studied behavioral biases for a long, long time. And one of the problems is that we intellectually get them, but we don't emotionally get them. Mm -hmm. We think, we think that canvas is going to allow, uh, at least in some regards, uh, us to put those biases on the side of the investor, because there's, there's this thing called the Ikea effect, 
when, when you build something yourself, you, you endow it with more meaning than you do if you don't. Mm-hmm. And so investors become much more patient. They become much more, okay, let's see how this plays out. And so that, that hair trigger emotional urge, let's say things aren't going great for them, to, to sell gets lessened. So I, I just think I'm super excited about it. I think that we'll learn a ton going forward. Um, and I definitely think by 2025, every major asset firm will, will have some customization available. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, and I agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's an idea whose time has come, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, kind of technology trends, um, you know, market trends. I, I think even, you know, consumer trends, you know, if we, if we look at kind of the evolving landscape of wealth and, and who has wealth, you know, in, in, in the U.S. and globally, you know, you know, I think it's increasingly, you know, folks who who are looking for those solutions, you know, and, and that I think that that message kind of kind of resonates. And and so you mentioned that your son, Patrick, uh, you know, is, is, is now, you know, taking over the firm, you know, and, and you know, listening to, you know, he has a, a very successful podcast, uh, you know, that, that I listen to quite often. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's you know, very focused on technology and, and, and really kind of cross asset, uh, you know, venture, you know, early stage. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some great guests. And I'm sure kind of some of those insights were, were key in, in, in the way that, you know, the canvas product has come together, but, you know, I think it's also interesting that, you know, uh, you know, Jim, you're a young guy, you know, and, and you handed, you know, you handed the keys over to Patrick and, and, you know, with, in family businesses, you know, succession is always, you know, a big question. And, you know, if we kind of take a step back and look, um, you know, I, I think the fact, you know, the figure is something like, you know, 10 million, you know, businesses founded by baby boomers in the United States are going to uh, you know, change hands, you know, and perhaps, you know, in the coming years. And so, you know, how, how did, um, you know, so, so, you know, how did, you know, O'Shaughnessy kind of approach the question of succession and kind of what did you learn from that process? Um, you know, that might be interesting for, for, for other folks who are either on, you know, kind of, the sell side or the or, or the buy side, you know, you know, kind of you know, looking to, to exit their firm or 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 perhaps looking to, to step into a firm, um, you know, kind of undergoing uh, you know a, a transition like that. Sure. So I take succession very very seriously. I think it's one of the most overlooked parts, both in um, in privately owned companies, uh, but even in some publicly owned companies, and certainly in charitable uh, organizations. So. <clears throat> I was the chairman of the board of uh, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center here in New York. And um, the first thing that I noticed was we didn't have a good succession plan. And so I, I wanted that fixed right away. Thankfully, it worked out beautifully. Um, my, my successor chair, is, she's done a magnificent job. But it also got me thinking about OSAM. And so... So Patrick, um, it's, it's interesting. Patrick had to be twice as good because his name was Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Mm-hmm. And, and I threw him in the deep end. Um, I, I uh, intentionally put him into situations that would test him uh, with some of our toughest clients, with um, some tough portfolio reporting uh, during the great financial crisis. And um, he, he did really, really well. And I knew that as his father, I, again, back to human nature, right? I knew that I can't like set myself aside and say, well, I'm very dispassionate about my son. I'm not, come on. So what I did was I sought feedback from people who I deeply respected as clients um, and who were tough. And um the feedback was sort of uniformly, this kid is going to knock it right out of the ballpark. And so Patrick had, um, you know, a lot to prove and he did it. He, he proved more than he had to prove. And so I decided um, that happened earlier than I was expecting. I love youth and I love youthful energy and youthful ideas. And, and Patrick and I are very simpatico in terms of what we um, want to achieve, how we want to achieve it, et cetera. Uh, so I thought, you know what? Let's send a message to the marketplace that OSAM's not going anywhere. 
Mm -hmm. Um, at the time, I, I think I was in my late fifties, uh, Patrick was in his early thirties. Um, and that's exactly the message that the marketplace took. They were like, Oh, okay. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess, I guess the O'Shaughnessy's are in this for the long run. You got to be really, you've got to understand the signals you send to your client base. You have to respect them. You have to, um, never try to trick them. And, and I think that by doing this, I'm still very much involved. I'm the chairman of the firm. And, um, but, but this is Patrick's show now. And um, I, I do everything I can to make it his call. Um, and that's the way it's been. You know, the, the Canvas initiative, uh, all of that, even though I've loved that kind of stuff forever, that was Patrick coming up and saying, hey, it was so funny. He walked into my, he walked into my office. And he was reviewing all of the tech that we had built for, for internal systems. Um, and he sat down and he looked at me and he goes, dad. Yeah. He said, we built the death star to kill a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then thus was born canvas. And uh, so, uh, you know, again, I, I think, the, uh, I, I think Andy Jassy said the same thing to Bezos at one point. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it, it, it is actually yeah. true. And actually that, I like that example because uh, Patrick and I, uh, Patrick in particular, he's very good at weaving thoughts from a variety of disciplines. I, you know, one of the things I'm a huge believer in is the ability to synthesize ideas is what's coming next. And, and I'm pretty good at that. And, and he's really good at it. And AWS is a perfect example. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe if we start offering this and, and the rest was history. So, so I think that's pretty much, that was very much part of the thinking of Canvas, mm -hmm. the example of AWS. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's interesting because we have come to love uh, uh, Patrick's job. So this is uh, an interesting thing, uh, what you are saying. And it's true that he, he has uh, uh, kind of demonstrate to the world that He's uh, uh, as good as you, or even better. I'd be the first to say better. I'd be the first to say better. That's the thing. So actually, in our case, uh, since we like his job, so we have published the Spanish version of Patrick Osagnes' book, Millennial Money. And the strategy explained uh, uses a simple set of five criteria that get at the heart of the factors that drive investing performance over time. It looks for firms with high shareholder deal, uh, indicating that they are focused on providing value to the owners uh, of their stock, high return on invested capital, inexpensive valuation, evaluations, operating cash flow that exceeds accounting earnings and relative strength in the top 75 of the market. Would you care explain to our Spanish audience your thoughts on this book and its implications for millennial investors new to investing? Sure. So um, it's also a good example of um, what you want to read Patrick's book, Millennial Money For, is for the context, I think. Uh, and by that, I mean, he's very good at explaining to you why you need to think a certain way, as opposed to maybe the natural way that you would think about investing as a millennial. Um, he, he did a very funny thing uh, comparing the grandpa portfolio, that would be me, um, and the millennial portfolio, that would be all the hot names. Um, and at the time, it, uh, the grandpa portfolio did significantly better. <laughs> um, and, and, and so what he was trying to playfully uh, explain was um, the, the hot dot, the, the, the narrative stock, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's going to work very well. Most times it's not, because what happens is by all the factors that you just listed, he, he, he makes it so you can't buy them because they're either too expensive or they, they are not, they don't have meet the correct criteria, et cetera. So I think that Patrick's book is a great starting place for young investors um, who uh, you know, want to learn the, the, how to, the, the, the structure of how to think about investing. Um, I think Patrick would be the first to say that well, he loves that strategy. There are others now. We're we're back to talking about the evolution of our strategies um, that that um, uh, he he might recommend. Uh, we make them pretty much 
we use a Lucite box, not a black box. So um, you can go to osam.com and, and find many of them outlined there. But, but the point is uh, discipline built around a, a framework as opposed to hit and miss, got a hunch, but a bunch. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a timeless lesson uh, for all investors. And I think that uh, it, for that reason, I'm, I'm delighted to hear you've translated it, it into Spanish. Yeah, we are very happy about that, actually. Very, very happy. So thanks a lot, Jim. This has uh, been a really interesting uh, uh, interview. This is the first part. So we'll go now uh, for the second, but thanks a lot uh, for our audience. I think, the, I, I mean, as you know, we're going to uh, interpret this uh, interview into Spanish. So our audience can, uh, they're going to uh, listen to you in, in, in Spanish. So this is going to be fun also. And um, and nothing, thanks a lot for, for coming over and nothing. Let's uh, continue with the second part. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you.